Hello and welcome to Building the Premier Accounting Firm. I'm your host, Roger Connect, President of Universal Accounting Center, and this podcast is dedicated to helping owners of accounting, bookkeeping, and tax firms, in fact, have the Premier Accounting Firm in their area. It's here that we address each and every week various topics ranging from marketing, selling accounting services, pricing those services, offering quality services, onboarding clients, mental health, and so, so much more. Each and every week we have on the show guests. They are the experts in these various areas, and they share with us the various tips, tricks, and suggestions that we can have in order to become the leaders we need to become. Now, as your host, my goal each and every week is to have on guests that are basically experts in their own rights, and today is going to be no exception. I'm happy to invite on the show Mark Cook. Mark happens to be president of Windfall Partners and offers five-star keynotes and consults through a system to lead. Mark and his firm gets leaders unstuck and thriving with their teams. After turnarounds as chief executive and tech exits, Mark led and leads the largest ever studies of award-winning leaders and has written a new New York Times bestseller, Great Work with David Sturt. So, Mark, welcome to the show. Oh, thank you. I'm excited to be here. This is a great audience. I love, I actually serve a lot of accounts and love accounts. This is great. Well, I'm sure the message you have is going to resonate today because I found it impressive. Let me go back, though, and just kind of give it some context. How did you end up in the business of ideas? I mean, obviously, you become <laughs> a business coach and so forth, kind of unique. How did you get here? Oh, dear. You know, I, there's a couple of answers to this. I'll, I'll tell you the youngest one, if that's okay. When Please. I was uh, 14, sadly, my father uh, got cancer. And, and just as I turned 15, passed away. My mother was nervous about me. So she pushed me in the workforce. I don't know how it was legal, but I went to work at a grocery store at 15. And uh, it's interesting, you know, the people across the street made $15 an hour at ba- as baggers. And I made 285 when the minimum wage was 385. I still trying to figure that out. <laughs> but uh, I still remember the first day I was just terrified. I was in the enemy high school's district in this store. I'm, I'm just starting high school. I have no idea how to be a worker. And I have a Mr. Brown, I'll call him as, as the manager, who is very stern, very traditional, <laughs> very, very 50, 1950s. And uh, then he, he assigned me to a young bagger named Dave, who I'm still friends with, and he's a neighbor. And uh, he said, Dave, train him on everything. And, and Dave said, look, we take the groceries out. And he taught me how to bag them. And he says, you don't ask, you just do it unless they tell you not to, because that's what we do. We're high servants. So I remember the first day of prime time, Saturday morning. You guys can probably picture Saturday morning in a grocery store. <laughs> and uh, I, I saw a check stand open up. And so here I go on my work history and career. And I arrive at Mrs. I'll call her Mrs. Queen. And I uh, arrive at Mrs. Queen's check stand, bag of groceries, put the Pepsi bottles uh, horizontally on the bottom and charge out chasing her. And, as we hit the seam in the parking lot, it's headed downward, and those glass bottles just plow into the parking lot and break like a firework oh, <laughs> right in no. front of everyone. Car stopped. I, I just instinctively didn't. I didn't. I didn't know what to do. So instinctively, I pull a twenty dollar out of my wallet, twenty dollar bill. I run inside and I'm pointing it at <laughs> Mister Brown, and he is just holding his head. And he's saying, no, I don't want $20. We, that's not what we do. Get out there, clean it up. Well, you know, I did. And after I came in, Dave pulls me aside and he says, hey, don't worry about it. We've all done that with those stupid bottles. It happens to all of us. Don't worry. You're doing great. Just keep going. It'll work out. So I did. Next week, very next week, Saturday comes, prime time at the grocery store. Mrs. Skeen's check stand opens up again. Oh, I had to go, so I went. I was reluctant. She said hello. She was forgiving, but she was in a hurry, so I made sure I bagged it right. We charged out. We're going to the door, and as you probably noticed, there's free magazines at the door. For some reason, she decides to put on the brakes, stop, and grab a free magazine. And you can guess where the front end of the shopping cart went, right into her Achilles. So it just falls down. Oh, my word. This, and I just couldn't believe it. 
and Mr. Brown's wagging his finger and, and, and being stern. Dave pulls me aside and he goes, look, stuff like that happens all the time. Don't worry. Just keep going. So here's the home stretch. Third week. Mrs. Queen's check stand opens up. I walk the other way. I'm not doing, I'm not facing her again. All of a sudden I hear Mr. Brown on the 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 PA. Hey, Mark Cook, check stand two. Mark Ch- Cook, check stand two. So I, I run over there. I bag her groceries. I'm very careful. This is going to be my success. And we go out and like all of us do, we pack the groceries in the corner of the hatchback and we put blankets and whatever else is back there to hold it up. I had done it with victory. I slammed the hatchback down. The only problem was the corner buried itself right in her scalp and put her to her knees, screaming and moaning. I I couldn't believe it. I, I was just going to walk in and quit. I was just done. So I walk in the grocery store and Mr. Brown, I can see is furious. You've seen the whole thing. And uh, Dave pulls me in the back immediately. And Dave says, hey, Mark, look, I'm going to be honest with you. Not many people do that one. (laughs) But I've watched you with the parents. You're over here in a different high school's area. I've watched you with the kids. You're amazing. I guarantee if you just keep trying, I think you're going to get promoted. You're going to get promoted. And sure enough, two years later, I was in the big camera bar. I got to have all the movies back in the DVD and the video days that I wanted. And I'd arrived in heaven and and, uh, graduated and retired from that grocery store to my next venture with success. And the reason I tell that story is because, you know, back in that day, my mom hadn't been in the workforce. My dad was passed on. And I was without a rudder at the workplace. And the leader in that scenario, in that story that I I remember all the time, may not have been the formal leader. It was Dave. It was Dave. And I think, uh, you know, it drove a curiosity uh, in me. I just needed to know how to lead. I needed to know how to work. And ever since then, I've been staring, watching and looking for, even passing up better opportunities in order to be able to investigate rigorously how to be successful at work and how to lead. And, you know, the most recent thing that happens, I got a spine infection. I ended up four months on my back. It put me in a an opportunity to develop and reconstitute the things I learned to put it into my own practice. And at the end of that, I went out on my own and that's how Windfall Partners was born, more investigation of leading success. So that's a long story, but it's a, it's, it's, it's how it happened. You know, every one of us, I'm sure has that first career, that first job, many of which we had when we were all teenagers. Uh, The work ethic that you're demonstrating there, that that persistence, very important. But then that mentoring, someone in that company that's willing to pull you aside and just kind of teach you the ropes, but more importantly, help you through those challenges, very instrumental. And I can relate to it. Uh, My careers are such that, you know, as a teenager, I had some positions, but I did have a long stint at Little Caesars Pizza. And it's there I learned a lot of the management and so forth as I got to run the the store uh, as I grew older. And I think one of the things that I really want to emphasize here is two points. It's the work ethic. Uh, I really attribute my father for that. I, I think there's that that willingness, that persistence of just getting it done. And I think that really makes up for a lot of a lot of things. But it's also like you were saying, the mentor. I had some wonderful people that took me under their wing that were willing to explain things, kind of answer the question of because or why. And it was through those insights that I became a lot a lot better I was a little bit more knowledgeable about things. And so I appreciate that perspective. So do you have a particular mentor or someone that you felt was instrumental in your business success that you are fond of and and uh, have a principle that you can share that you learned from them? Oh, dear. I mean, that's kind of a softball question because um, I, you know, I haven't had a perfect career like most people, um, but I have been super fortunate and blessed. You know, I grew up working for Hiram Smith at, at Franklin Covey, but then quickly they merged with with Covey Leadership, and and I got to go to work 
uh, ultimately for Stephen Covey and then his son, Stephen M. R. Covey. And I love those two guys and they are outstanding leaders. They, they walk their talk and, you know, I've got endless stories about how they saw things from my perspective and sacrificed for my career. And, you know, who gets to start a, a professional career being mentored by the, the pair of Stephen Covey's. And then, you know, after that, um, I was recruited by Ray Nord, one of the founders of Novell, and my buddy and I co-founded Center 7 C7 uh, that, that ended up being a really big success for that venture firm, um, Canopy. And, you know, Ray Norda was someone who came to work in a Dodge truck. He was one of the only two billionaires in Utah or the whole West. And, and he was a billionaire driving up in his Dodge truck in his, his cowboy boots. And I, I, I got to go ask him questions whenever I felt like, what do you think the career success is in life? And he'd tell me, and, and uh, you know, I'm not sure who is lucky enough to get mentored by, you know, billionaires and Stephen Covey's. And so clearly I got the bug of ideas and how powerful they can be for a leader and gaining success. But, you know, I, in those two instances, I got a little taste of research. And at Franklin, I got to publish a magazine where I got to interview icons like Liddy Dole and Herb Keller and Walter Payton and you name it. And then uh, I got another taste at, at C7. It was a startup. You know, we started with literally both of us in the same cube and sharing a garbage can that we had to steal from our host. <laughs> and and uh, we had to, we, we had a budget. You know, we had good funding from Ray's group, the Canopy Group at the time. And we, we uh, traveled all over the United States asking leaders at Oracle and other places how to do what we were doing. We were building a one of the first MSPs in, in data centers in the West that was really a high-end bank-grade facility and software development firm. And, and uh, it was a tremendous research assignment. And so my, my thirst for learning how to find out how other people lead and how other people succeed at work has just never diminished and is stronger today than ever. So what then caused you to go out and start your own business? I mean, that's a totally different thing. The entrepreneur spirit doesn't really exist with everyone. And uh, you were obviously being successful in your career. So why take the leap of faith and start your own business? Uh, you, you mean way back then when? Uh, I was at Franklin. The first time I started my own business was, was le- departing Franklin Covey. And uh, they, they, it was like working at Camelot there. In fact, I've had discussions about going back there a few times. I don't, I won't because I know they're tremendous again, but I just can't spoil those memories. I can't change them. I don't even want them to change. They're so wonderful. So I don't go back there and I, I don't, I don't know that I'll ever work for someone again, but, but back at the end of that, um, you, you know, the two companies had merged. And if you looked at the revenue chart, it was starting to plateau a bit and people blame it on the merger, and I disagree with that as a, a business scientist and researcher. I, I think it was obvious what was going on, the life cycle of a, a 20-year-old book that was a bestseller, and the advent of Palm Pilot. You know, I remember <laughs> a, a marketing meeting when, when we had had literally 20 devices show up that would replace the planner, the leather braided $250 binder with the gorgeous paper that will never turn yellow. You know, I remember that. And, and we would see device after device and you had to boot them up and wait and go through a menu and it was monochrome and, you know, it just didn't work. Some of them really tried to be voice command back then. They, none of them worked. And one of the one, people don't realize that maybe back in the day, the planner, the, the big use thing was the, the phone book. You looked up who you had to call. So, so uh, I remember the day Palm came and I, I was presented with uh, my leader at the time, the executive, we, we, another device. We didn't, they were a tiny group of small guys and, I was a youngster just starting out my career, and I remember them handing us all a palm, and and uh, I dragged my fingertip on that after he brought it out of the meeting and saw my name because they'd loaded our our group's names in it, and I drew a C, and my whole contact information immediately showed up after one button push, 
and I immediately became frightened <laughs> and uh, knew that things had to change. And so, you know, it, they did better than I projected and lasted longer than I projected and then came back stronger than ever with the Covey's help. But but I, I knew that that was going to be a time where I had to go out and try some of the things I'd learned in marketing and leadership on my own. And so I did. I, I left and got a great client in a big Uinta golf company at the time and some others. And, and I just went out on my own until Ray came calling and then a couple other, you know, one other turnaround came calling and I, I went back to work for people for a while and now I'm on my own again. Yeah. So two things, one, that was a nice nostal nostalgic, uh, walk through the past i remember my franklin planner i had those i remember the palm pilot had one i mean uh, i had my nextel phone that was the walkie talkie i mean some great things that were all technological advancements all leading up to and culminating in the smartphone that we've been using for the last 10 years or so so yeah uh, and it's only been 10 years i think it came out I think the first one was like 2010 or 2012 so it's uh, still fairly recent uh, let's talk about the bold encounter what that is to you and I think that's what what is going to really resonate with our audience yeah wow this is an important one for your audience actually um, look I have a New York Times bestseller and it's got tasks listed by chapter in it and I've got a couple other books, and they list tasks, actions to be taken. And uh, a few years ago, a client came to me and said, I know that not everyone, you don't expect everyone to be able to accomplish these things as you wish, but we really would like more people to do these tasks, and they're not. So could you look into that and... And you know this is a this is a perpetual problem for people like accounts and, and, and consultants and people that do service in business is that you know you say do A and they don't not only do they not do A and do Z they just don't do anything and so um, I uh, there's a there's a frustration to get people to do things and so I looked into it and they were paying me to do it and so. I examined uh, old encounters and had new conversations with old contacts and, and you know, did a, a admittedly um, less rigorous than the two million uh, case studies that I'd done. But, you know, at, at arriving at about a thousand leaders in business, uh, I discovered something that has changed my whole practice the last couple of years. It's really big. And it's and I don't even refer people to the old books anymore because this is so important. And here it is. Tasks are like a peanut, and yet if you don't surround that peanut with chocolate, you're not going to get people to eat the, 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 the peanut most often. And so when you're going into performing something at all at work, nothing great happens alone. Nothing. If you try to go solo, good luck. So this ecosystem that you have around you, the, the clients that you're trying to serve are human beings. And if you, if you aren't exceptional at how you approach a new a conversation, a new person, if you don't know how to have a better icebreaker, if you don't know how to adjust and flex how you cooperate, if you don't know the human side of work, then you're dealing with just peanuts. And it's changed my whole view of work, like the, the encounter with the other human being initially. And then over time, you know, depending on what it is you're doing in leadership and the timing of the cadence of leadership in, in a strategy or a path of success, you know, there's different groups you have to interact with. And so there's different encounters you have. And if you don't, bold does not mean aggressive. Bold means courageous and correct and effective. And so bold encounters is about the chocolate covered part of the task that I still promote heavily, which is what you in the end accomplish together. So what I'm hearing you describe is basically a leader, someone that is able to give direction and more importantly, inspire those that they're working with. So how would you define a competent, capable leader? Yeah, good question. I I think the the original answer is one of the best still. You know, if you look at the etymology of lead, 
uh, in or leader. It's it's coming out of English and Germanic languages as Leiden. And I won't try to spell that because I can't because it's not, you know, some of the letters don't work, but over audio. But but Leiden is one of the early terms to for lead. And originally it meant to go and to as though to pursue out ahead on a path, to go to travel down that path. But the the other connotation that it originally meant was to direct and orchestrate. So I think some of the just those two original meanings of lead are so essential not to lose. And we have a thousand definitions of leading now. But think about orchestration. You know, leadership is not about being the first fiddle alone without anyone else in the room. Leadership is about being the first fiddle and, and harmonizing with the rest of the fiddle group. I'm probably saying the wrong word, but but you know, helping lead the rhythm. But but up front, you have these great maestros that orchestrate the timing and encourage people when they do something well, even with a facial expression. And you watch the greats, how they lead, and orchestration is creating that that synergy within lot, a lot of human beings. And so these interactions that are actually business interactions, the first bold encounter you should have is with yourself. The first conversation is, am I getting up on time? Am I making the first phone call to become a rainmaker so that I can be partner? Or am I just going to go do the project that's so urgent and get it done for the client? If you want to be a partner, you're going to be a rainmaker. That means you're going to be picking up the first call. And even when you're a partner, instead of just gliding because business is great and you're relying on passive word of mouth, there are ways to be proactive and create referrals and get people to give references that are bold and exciting. And, and that work is not always fun to start. I'll tell you what, though, after you start it, it's amazing and it, it creates joy in life. So it is orchestration. It's it's it starts with the individual and then you go out, you know, to another individual and you're supporting weekly goals and daily steps to those goals. And then it goes out to the team, maybe five or maybe a hundred people on a team. And that's usually a quarterly negotiation of who does what and then the shared incentives and what those incentives are. And then it goes out maybe two years. I like two years. It could be one to three years. And not the common definition of a mission. You know, mission is such a beautiful word that business hijacked it and turned it into a synonym of purpose. And that's not what a mission is in any other context. But the mission that accomplishes something specific, that's about two years out and that's multiple teams. And so as a leader, you're orchestrating multiple teams. You know, there's the account, there's the, the auditors, there's the tax people, there's the marketing people, there's the administration. You're orchestrating across the teams and they're all achieving something better, a better state for clients in two years. And then the vision is five years out. You're making that visible in a few different ways. So that's what orchestration is. It's a cadence down a path forward with different timings and different groups ranging from an individual in front of you all the way to the ecosystem and the clients you serve in general at an event, maybe. So there's lots of encounters that need to be bold. So you were talking earlier that preceding this, you talked a lot about tasks. So I just want to see, is there any highlight or talking point that would be applicable here that we should hear about tasks and perhaps how they relate to problem solving? Oh, yeah. Well, there's one that there's one in particular. Um, you know, let me just say this. Brainstorming is not the most effective way to solve a problem, but by far. The status quo, the big mountain of activity in business when there's a problem is, let's get together, let's talk about it. Well, it's not the best way. You know, w one of the best stories, thing it is past, um, e either from my own research or the Cubbies. I can't remember, frankly, where it's from, but I love this story. It's very effective at il illustrating this, that there, there was a, a hospital in London. And in that hospital, it was, it was a pediatric cardiology clinic that we're talking about. And sometimes these young heart pages sadly would come in so dire and in so much danger that they had to rush them directly to the ER without admitting them and, and, and doing what they usually do. And because it was outside of the normal process 
they would make mistakes. And because they would make mistakes, at some point, kids started dying and something had to be done. And so the the lead doctor got people together, the normal team, one of them even included a PhD in nursing. I never even heard of that, but but they got together, the expected team, and they hunkered down and they brainstormed and they barely made any progress. And then one day, one of the doctors was walking through the waiting room and saw a for, uh, a fortune or not a fortune, but a, a race car driver, uh, a race car. What am I trying to say? A, a a formula race is what I'm trying to say. A formula race on the TV screen, and very quickly the pit crew came on the screen. And in six seconds, they changed all four tires. They checked the air intake valve and flushed it. They put all the gas back in it. And that thing raced off in six seconds. And there was a moment of truth in that doctor's mind. He thought, well, I can either go back and still work with the same team and try to solve this, or we could reach out as many times as we need and get a hold of that pit crew. And they could tell us a thing or two about emergent process. And so they did. He, it took him several calls. And finally, they called him out and said, hey, how, how can we help you? And he said, well, we have this problem. He said, we don't know anything about heart surgery. We're, we're not going to engage in that, trying to give you advice about that. He says, no, 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 no. I really think you could help us. Please just spend a couple hours on the phone with us, and let's talk through process and, and some of your thinking. Immediately, they reduced errors 55%. 55%. So often we think a task is what needs to happen. Let's just put effort behind it, all of us that usually do, and let's get this done. But there are so many encounters that happen in business and leadership that can accentuate and solve problems faster. That's just one of five that I regularly use. But to get people out of that current team and and communicating with what I call adjacent experts, people that are serving the same principle or the same need of human beings, but not the same market. Or maybe they're serving the same market, but not in the same way. And a lot of the, the partners in accounting firms, you know, they are friends and go to networking breakfasts and lunches with insurance agents and other professionals that do business services. And, and more often, they should be talking about specific problems of firms, and they should be envisioning future success of each other's clients and sharing prospects, future visions, and then solving those problems together rather than just trading business cards. Because real encounters are about relationships and communication and, and breakthrough ideas. So that, that gives you a little taste of the two. Yeah, I appreciate that. You know, as you were speaking, I was reminded of a book I'm currently reading. It's called Atomic Habits. And in there, he does a great job of explaining how it's these minor things, kind of like the pit crew you were describing. It's these minor things that when done efficiently and effectively can accelerate success and more importantly, dramatically improve the production. And so he does a great job in naming his book, I feel, because he points out Atomic is both that very small, microscopic type of thing, but it's also atomic in the sense that that explosive, so large, so impactful type of experience. And when you compare those two, I think that illustrates such a phenomenal point that we can, in our lives, in our business, find things that if we just tweak or or minutely affect certain habits that we have in our lives, they could really resonate as to very big changes within our personal and professional careers. So yeah, um, let, let, do, you, do you mind if I just add something to what you just said? Yeah. Um, I have a, I have a friend, very dear friend, such a great mentor. Uh, his name is Mike Glauser. He's a professor. And um, I, I think he got his, I, I think he went through his PhD program at Vandermelde to Purdue. Suddenly I'm just, you know, I'm getting old and I forgot where he went. So forgive me, Mike, if you hear this, but, but he did a study with another gentleman um, and they found the same thing that, that I did. I was sharing with him bold encounters the other day because we talk a lot. And he goes, holy cow, this is exactly what I found out in, in my thesis when I did it. And I said, tell me. And he said, well, you know, we ended up publishing a paper. Uh, and he said, what we found was shocking. If you take two leaders 
And you, you know, that's a gener- that's a simplification. You have to do representative samples, of course. But if you take two leaders and one of them, you rate you rate both of their management skills, and one of them has really strong management skills. And then you take the other leader, and they have tremendous business outreach skills, but not as strong at management. So you compare the strong internal in the halls over Zoom with their own employees manager that is weak or a little lighter on business outreach, and you compare them with the business outreach champion, guess who predicts the best client outcomes and financial returns? Shockingly, the outreach does. You want to you want to take your firm to the next level, get talking to new people, get talking to people that are adjacent to what you do, that fulfills some of the, the deeper emotional needs, not just the, the IRS needs, but deeper client needs that people need to have fulfilled. And you get new ideas that are not in your fishbowl. They're a different fishbowl. And so they're not invisible to you. They get a little cold water on your skin and they wake you up and you have a bold, you know, you have this breakthrough idea. And like you say, it's just the one sometimes that just breaks things loose. Mm -hmm. But you can spend a lot of time in your halls and offices trying to manage things ahead the same old way. And if you're in that ER in London, you're just making marginal success. So that brings me to a question about thriving then, you know, really, really having a great deal of success, getting unstuck, as you were describing, you know, that that routine that you're alluding to. Uh, How does someone really thrive, especially as a leader? How does someone get unstuck and break the paradigm that they're in in, and do something great? How do you how would you suggest that? Well, uh, to oversimplify it, two things. One is. You better have a path with steps that goes forward. Uh, so it's a little little more nuanced than than a plan. I'll tell you about tell you about the path in a second. Uh, but the second thing, besides having steps on a path forward that you can see, you better you better realize that you're going to hit obstacles because everyone does. Even CEOs disagree with their boards. They fight with each other. Things slow down in the economy, as we sometimes experience. (laughs) But things get in the way because that's what life is. Life is us targeting something, pursuing it on a path, and running into obstacles and trying to get through them or around them. And so you have to have the second half, which is a problem-solving set of methods that works fast and effectively. Don't just get in an office and think to yourselves yet again through the the proven ineffective way of brainstorming. So, you know, there's a place for brainstorming when it's small and you, you need to do that part of it and you're preparing to do something real. But there, there are far better things that, that solve problems in brainstorming. Anyway, and I just gave you one of them. So let's go back to the path. I, I, I've interviewed some really great people. One of the greats, you know, you mentioned the cell phone. Um, and I interviewed, I interviewed Marty Cooper twice, two or three times, actually helped him on a project. Even Marty Cooper was the father of the cell phone. You know, he went to work at the tiny little company called Motorola. And when he went there, they assigned him to a, a project where he was installing a big piece of telephone equipment with his team in the console of a car to create the first car phone. Well, he went to work and and he started, it started to bother him. And he started thinking about where they should arrive. And he thought, you know, if I am a telephone user of the future, I don't want to call a place. I want to call a person. And he started thinking and he thought, you know, when I have to call my mom, her telephone, you know, I'm old enough to remember the gangly wire connected to the wall. And he thought to himself, if I, when I call my mom, if, if she's nowhere near the kitchen, I've got a few rings and then I miss her because, you know, voicemail didn't exist. And back then he said, you know, when I try to call my brother, he's in his office and his telephone's tethered to the desk. And if he's not in his office, I can't get a hold of him. And he started thinking about a, a, vis- a vision 
a place just beyond the horizon with elements that look like a picture, even a video, and even a even an episode for our episodic memory. And he started thinking, you know, I can see people using phones that are on their person, not tethered to anything, not even a car. And he went out into the field, and this is a second problem-solving method that you know, professional innovators like him use, but also award-winning leaders get their teams to do instead of brainstorming. Get out in the space of the problem. Get out in the field and watch people use. And so he went to airports and saw CB radio users, and he went to HVAC companies and said, can I shadow your driver? Who does that? Well, someone who changes the world like him. So he he followed him and he noticed something, you know, that poor HVAC guy, when he goes in the basement, he can't have his CB radio with him. It's, it's in the truck. And that's a problem. And he saw that problem. And then he went to the airport and people were running around all over the place. They didn't they couldn't take their CB radio with them because it was tethered. And he could see the future. And he said, This Tethering this to the car is not acceptable as a future phone user. So we're gonna we're gonna switch things up. That was a he asked a question that was very unpopular with the team, his team. He said, So would you rather call a person or a place? Very unpopular question with a bunch of engineers excited to fit all the equipment into a console. And uh he he prevailed. He kept at it, and because of that, we have transformed how rural people in China communicate and rural people in India and all the places that still don't have telephone wires strung everywhere. We have changed the human communication possibilities. And it's because he saw a vision of the future. So that's that's the destination on a leadership path. And people are so obsessed with how you lead or who leads like what and character i've done i've done nine different studies i've never been able to predict an outcome of a client or financial success by a characteristic and by the way a lot of people have tried to and the rigorous ones haven't either but what you can predict is someone who puts in other people's minds in their orchestration a path and a destination and that destination has steps Sometimes they're daily, sometimes they're weekly. Some, for a team, they're quarterly. For a set of teams that have to cross cooperate, they're two years, one to three years. And then for an organization that's trying to change a market, it's probably about five years. Uh, Ten's too much. A lot of people push ten. Psychologically, we don't we don't see very clearly, even with tons of effort, ten years out. So it's about five years that vision, and it is vivid. And it's in the back of my brain where my optic nerves operate and I can see it as a, an employee. And that takes a lot of encounters and a lot of communication. You know, I appreciate you giving us that perspective as we're each running our businesses. There are things that uh, sometimes we get stuck on. Sometimes we just lack that clarity and vision. Sometimes we're just not being the leaders we need to be to inspire our teams or for that matter, our clients. So I, I like this perspective of just seeing what it is we could do to you know, think a little bit bigger, dream a little bit bigger, and more importantly, get out there and act and make some things possible. You know, Mark, I really appreciate you giving us some of these insights. And what I want to do is, as we wrap this up, I want to, first of all, encourage the listeners that if you'd like to speak with Mark, he offers a brief brainstorming session without any obligations or priorities. You can go to the episode description and hear actually some uh, things that you could actually use. So what it is, is in the episode description, go there and you'll get the information you need where you can actually take the time to schedule this with Mark if you'd like to explore these a little bit deeper. In addition to that, what I'm going to do is put some information here as to what it is you could be doing to work on your business. It's basically a book called In the Black. It has nine principles that you can apply in your business to ensure that you're being profitable. These nine principles help you work on, as Mark was suggesting, the short-term midterm and long-term things that you could be doing in your business to actually take your company to an entirely new level as you're being the leader you need to be. Now, in addition to that, one of the things I'd like to do is just kind of do a recap of our conversation and come back to you, Mark, for a closing thought. Uh, the first thing is, uh, as a summary, Mark was very good to point out that getting into this whole 
a set of business leadership was a journey. He's had a tremendous opportunity of meeting with some of the the great people in past times. Uh, Stephen Covey is someone that I've admired and learned from. And uh, I do remember the time of all the planners, the Franklin Covey experience of just working with purpose and intent and through the planning, obviously having the day, the the week planned out. It really made for a, product, a more productive workflow. And I do re- remember the evolution of that to the Palm Pilot and obviously, of course, today, the smartphone. Now, the thing that also really stuck out to me is the fact that as he was going through this entire process, he spoke of bold encounters. And really what that resonated for me there is the fact that we are in a people business. When we encounter or work with our clients, when we're talking to our peers, when we're trying to inspire our employees, our encounters need to be bold. They need to be purposeful. They need to be ones with confidence where they can be inspired by us. And as an encounter, I think we need to be really embracing the opportunity to be inspiring to those around us. And in doing so, I think that would really meet this bold encounter philosophy. He also spoke of leading and being a leader. Uh, I really feel that we need to have that that uh, vision, that direction of where we're needing to go. And I hope as you're looking at your company, your careers, you're able to actually identify where you can apply these principles of leadership so that you can in turn actually be inspiring to those around you. I like that we talked about tasks and problem solving. That was really important. Uh, Thriving and getting unstuck. I think that was very uh, helpful, kind of stepping outside of our, our comfort zones. A lot of really important principles that I hope that you were able to actually see their application in your lives. And most importantly, see how they can affect you as you're working on your business. So Mark, as a closing thought, what would you like to leave with everyone? Yeah, you know, I think uh, it, it sounds challenging, but I'm really challenging myself too. And I, and I do try to use my own process. Um, but if you're listening to this right now and, and, and you are leading anything, you might be making a lot of money. If you're an accounting managing partner and you're going to you're going to retire soon. You know, you're going to walk away with $10 million. That's great. That's great. But leadership is not about money alone. Um, and if you consider yourself an exceptional leader, then you have a path that you have articulated. And it's got milestones on it. And it's got a destination where people outside your firm get better in five years. And if you haven't painted a picture of that path with those milestones and especially that destination to your firm, you have some work to do as an exceptional leader, in my opinion. The second challenge is that if your people are out solving problems using numbers alone, they are missing an opportunity where they dig into the business, the actions and the tasks and the jobs that are happening in the business. And those are done in various ways by reaching outside of their current conversations to talk to new people in new ways about new things directly related to the problem or the department that they're analyzing or serving, especially the finance department. So problem solving and a path of leadership um, so that the weight isn't on your personality or who you are, how you manage, because managing is not leadership. That's how I would see it. That is wonderful. Well, Mark, thank you again for being on the show. I appreciate this. For the listeners, I do want to encourage you to go to the episode description and find some additional resources that we offer for free to help you as you're working on your business. These free resources are intended to give you the tools, the perspective, the insights that you need to consider as you're running your company. And again, they are free. Also, we'd like to invite you to GrowCon. GrowCon is an annual conference that we have for accounting professionals. This is where you can come and meet your peers, hear from the experts, and most importantly, work on your business. And so find out more about GrowCon and be sure to join us in May for this wonderful experience. It's a two-day live event that you want to actually attend and make the most of. And so put that on your calendar. Uh, The other that I'd want to encourage you to do is with regards to these principles, definitely subscribe to the podcast. If you haven't already, subscribe to the podcast so as to be reminded of each and every new episode that is released. And most importantly, go back and listen to the past episodes. It's there that we have the experts sharing very important principles that I'm sure will resonate with your business. Find those that interest you and listen to those and see how you can apply these principles in your business to, in fact, build the premier accounting firm. So subscribe and go back and listen to past episodes. Lastly, if you'd like to actually uh, apply 
apply these principles in your your business, in your life. If you'd, like, if you'd like to see what more you can do to, in fact, have the Premier Accounting Firm, we invite you to visit us at universalaccountingschool.com or give us a phone call. You can reach us at 801 265 Three seven seven seven, and always remember this: if it's about accounting, it is universal. Do take care. Have a great day, and be safe out there.